Well, since we're all ready, I guess, good afternoon and welcome to this side event during the 57th session of the Commission on Population and Development, titled SDGs and the Impact of Megatrends on Families, Perspectives from Asia. The event has been possible thanks to the co-sponsorship of the Permanent Mission of Malaysia to the United Nations, the International Federation for Family Development, and the Doha International Family Institute. This event is celebrated on the sidelines of the 30th anniversary of the International Conference on Population and Development, focusing on Asia as the most populated region with extensive family realities. This event also marks the culmination of seven regional expert group meetings organized in partnership with the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs to best assess the impact of megatrends on families worldwide. The conclusions of the Asian Regional Expert Group meeting held in Kuala Lumpur two months ago convey policy recommendations agreed among regional experts to further understand how the megatrends impact Asian families. Allow me to begin to give the floor for the opening remarks from Ms. Eh, Renata Kashmarska. She's the focal point of the family in the Division on Inclusive Social Development of UNDESA. Ms. Karmaska, you have the floor. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for organizing this event. Um, and of course, this event is on the margins of the 57th session of the Commission for, so for um, uh, Population and Development, is it? <laughs> and of course, we are celebrating this year the 30th anniversary of ICPD, and also we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. So this important milestone brings me here today, and I was asked to talk a, a bit about that and our preparations. So in the preparations for the, for the anniversary, we addressed the impact. Can you hear me well? The impact of um, megatrends on families and perspectives um, uh, um, families, the, um, the megatrends being new technologies, urbanization, migration, demographic trends, and this year our focus is on climate change. So as this event highlights the SDGs and the impact of megatrends on families and perspectives from Asia, let me briefly mention what UNDESA in cooperation with other partners such as IFFD and DFI um, uh, did in, in for, the, for the region of Asia. So as Alex mentioned, there was an, in February of this year, we held a regional expert group meeting uh, for Asia in Putrajaya, Malaysia, and the topic was families and megatrends, interlinkages between migration, urbanization, new technologies, demographic trends, and climate change. And that was organized with, with Doha International Family Institute, IFFD, and um, National Population and Family Development Board in Malaysia. And we had a wonderful welcome there in Malaysia. And um, uh, I have to thank for the hospitality of uh, LPPKN uh, there. The meeting was very well organized, and uh, we had excellent experts from um, many diverse, um, very diverse, we can say, Asian countries. So the meeting focused on the ways to achieve inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable cities for families. It analyzed strategies for optimizing the benefits of technology while minimizing the, its drawbacks on family relationships. It explored the policy lessons learned from Asia that can be applied globally and the potential contributions of global experience to the Asian um, context and offered recommendations for future family policy development. Um, beyond this meeting, we also, last year, we held a meeting, expert group meeting on demographic change and aging population in Asia, also a very important topic. Asia, and that was organized by the Center for Family and Population Research at the National University of Singapore and the Consortium of Institutes on Family in the Asian Region, CIFA, as well as Sao Paul Center on Aging at uh, the University of Hong Kong um, Special Administrative Region. Um, this time, the focus was on the impact of demographic changes, in particular aging on families and their well-being. We discussed aging, intergenerational solidarity and support, prevention of ageism, promotion of age-friendly, all-inclusive communities through advocacy and raising of public awareness, multi-sector collaboration on care and support, and the role of industry and social innovation, as well as the importance of policy infrastructure and development of relevant initiatives and measures was also addressed. And in this meeting, we also had participation from um, ESCAP. 
Uh, I must say that these two meetings demonstrated the high commitment of our partners in Asia to the ideals of the International of the Family and its objectives and follow-up processes. And they also demonstrated concern about the impact of megatrends on families and the very fast pace of changes in the region, especially in terms of rapid aging and technological impacts. So I would like to encourage you all to uh, take a look at the materials from both meetings, including papers and recommendations, as well as examples of good practices that may inspire your own work. So um, to conclude, I would like to invite you all to an event that will happen exactly in two weeks, on the 15th of May, the International Day of Families, uh, and it's focusing on families and climate change as well as the observance of the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. And at this meeting, we will discuss in more detail the regional meetings that we had and all the issues that I mentioned. So we will definitely explore those issues more. And I'm, and I'm happy to report also that uh, at that meeting, 15th of May, we'll have an expert from Malaysia who will present on their Family Wellbeing Index which we consider very good initiative. So congratulations on that as well to the government of Malaysia. Um, so thank you so much for your attention and I hope to see you at other events. Thank you, thank you Renata. Um, thank you for the commitment in best preparing the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family. This upcoming May 15th. And, and I will now Turn to Mr. Hairil Fatsili Akir, Deputy Director General of the National Population and Family Development Board, LPPKN, as we commonly know it, Ministry of Women, Family, and Community Development of Malaysia. Mr. Fatsili manages the execution of LPPKN's thematic programs on population, family development, and reproductive health services, as well as national population and family policies. He has 20 years of experience in development, family, policy, education programs, conducting social studies, and in implementing family-friendly policies in Malaysia. You may have the floor. <clears throat> okay. Mr. Moderator, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Government of Malaysia and National Population and Family Development Board, LPPKN, it is a great pleasure for me to speak at this side event. Thank you to the host, uh, IFD, DFI, and also Malaysia Permanent Mission to UN for uh, inviting me to this conference. As we gather here today, it is evident that the mega trends such as globalization, technological advancement, changing demographic, and shifting social norms are reshaping the fabric of our communities and the dynamic within our family. The family institution, which has long been considered the cornerstone of, so, of society, is not immune to this transformation. From the way we communicate and connect with our loved one to the roles and responsibilities within the family unit, these mega trends are influencing every aspect of family life. Ladies and gentlemen, megatrends, which are large-scale shifts that have a significant impact on society, are reshaping family institutions in profound ways. These trends are influencing the structure, dynamics, and function of families around the world in a very significant way. One of the key impacts of these megatrends on family in Malaysia is demographic, demographic shifts. Malaysia is experiencing rapid population growth for the past three decades resulted in Malaysia is benefiting on uh, first demographic dividend and second demographic dividend. However, the population growth has decreased. As you can see in the next slide, uh, okay, uh, this shows uh, how uh, our population uh, growth has declined. And next slide. And as you can see, the population growth has shifted and decreasing. Therefore, our population pyramid has shifted from the ideal bell shape to uh, and uh, uh, to uh, to uh, uh, the shape that we have uh, projected in 2040. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Total fertility rate also declined and effort has been made to address this uh, trend. Oh, this one. Okay. All right. okay. All right. okay. <clears throat> this demographic trend has implication for family structure and dynamic as young adults may delay marriage and children due to economic pressure and changing social norm. Additionally, rising age expectancy lead to an aging population which poses challenges for family in terms of providing care for elderly relatives, managing intergenerational relationship and financial planning for retirement. Urbanization is another significant mega trend affecting families in Malaysia as more people move from rural areas to cities in search of better economic opportunity. Family structure may become more fragmented with extended family living apart and relying on technology to stay connected. Urbanization also brings about changes in lifestyle and values, leading to increased stress and pressure on families to balance work and family responsibility for young couples. Globalization has also had a profound impact on family, mentioned families, which increased mobility and connectivity leading to cultural exchange and the adoption of new ideas and practices. On the other hand, globalization has facilitated, facilitated the mobility and migration which lead to families being dispersed across state and di district. This can create both opportunity and challenges for families as they navigate cultural diversity and changing social norm inside our society. Technological advancement, particularly in communication and information technologies, have re revolutionized the way families interact and communicate in Malaysia. While technology can enhance connectivity and facilitate access to resources and services, it also poses risks such as cyberbullying, addiction and privacy concern. Balancing the benefits and risks of technology is a challenge for families in Malaysia as they strive to maintain healthy relationship and well-being. Other than that, it has also raised concern about screen time digital addiction and high internet usage among kids and adolescents. Changing social norms and values are also shaping family dynamics in Malaysia. Traditional gender roles are evolving with women increasingly participating in the workforce and men also taking on caregiving responsibilities. These shifts in gender role can lead to conflict within families as they negotiate new roles and responsibility Additionally, changing attitudes toward marriage, divorce, and parenting are influencing family structure and norms in Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, in view of the above trends and challenges, Malaysia concern, Malaysia concern is to develop an impactful social system which can provide the support and protection for families to be strong and resilient. Throughout the implementation of current Malaysia Development Plan, the government, through National Population and Family Development Board, has further enhanced parenting education and skills to Malaysian family. Various programs and services have been implemented, such as premarital, premarital education, marriage enhancement, enrichment, and parenting skills for parents. In addition, we are currently reviewing our national family policy, which has ended in 2020. The new family policy will continuously emphasize us in educate, advocating the concept of family well-being based on family values. Enhancing parenting skills and family values is one of the efforts in promoting family programs and services in Malaysia. Pre-marriage and marriage en enrichment program will be continuously promoted across all communities to inculcate family values, parenting skills and effective communication to strengthen the marriage institution and family resilience. In addition, prudent financial management and healthy lifestyle will be promoted among young married couples. Social and mass media will be utilized to promote family education and knowledge enrichment programs. Furthermore, the government is improving the existing counseling services and family support system, 
we have also diversified our mechanism in delivering the family services via mobile family center to ensure the accessibility for all. The impact of mega trend on family is complex and multifaceted. While these trends present opportunity for growth and development, they also pose challenges that require innovative solutions and support from policymakers, practitioners, and community. By understanding and addressing the implication of mega trend on family, we can foster stronger, resilient, and inclusive family system that promote well-being and prosperity for all its members. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, um, allow me to take this opportunity to congratulate you, LPPKN and Malaysia, for such commitment to family policies and for your constructive engagement with civil society here in New York. Moving on to the interactive discussion, I would like to introduce to uh, Mr. Ignacio Socias, Director of International Relations of the International Federation for Family Development, IFFD. Mr. Socias holds a doctorate in law, and since 2010, his role has involved extensive global engagement in coordination with United Nations activities. He has visited 64 cities in 45 countries, participated in 206 international meetings, delivered 198 keynote speeches and conducted 87 high-level meetings with government officials. He has been instrumental in leading global projects as of families and societies in Europe, SDGs and families, and family policies globally with UNICEF, and inclusive cities for sustainable families globally with 234 cities and regions. Mr. Socias, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Alex, for your wide presentation. And um, I think we are here really to commemorate a double anniversary because this is the occasion of the 30th anniversary of ICPD and the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family, which, as Renata has just told, will be officially celebrated in just a few days. So as we get into those celebrations, I would like to very briefly start by telling you that this for us, for IFFD, has been the year of Asia. Why? Because of two very important events, among others. The first one has been repeatedly mentioned here, this expert group meeting we had hosted by the government of Malaysia with really very, very good experts from 12 Asian countries who were contributing. I will get into that a bit maybe later. But let me start by going to the fundamentals of our work. Right from the very start, we had very, very clear the importance of the International Year of the Family. Looking back and what was a bit low-key celebrations on the 10th anniversary, we really tried to promote it on 2014 for the 20th anniversary, and now 2024 for the 30th. Why? Because of something that every single resolution of the General Assembly about families say, that families need special attention, that it is crucial that they can really perform their role in society. Well, this is what we have tried to repeat once and again inside the UN, inside this building, inside other UN buildings, but also around the world. But let me be very, very clear about this. We, this is not just about being family friendly for appearances sake. We are 
about real fairness and equality. So that's why I personally don't like very much the term family friendly, because it kind of stresses uh, something more emotional than objective, that fair, which is what I think it should be. That's why we have talked about family oriented, family responsive, other ways to say it, I insist in my opinion better. And understanding how important families are to society means that it is really a matter of justice and um, we will have now next year the, the second World Social Summit marking another 30th anniversary. 30th anniversary of the Copenhagen Declaration and the first World Social Summit. And I think it's a very good opportunity to show the link between human rights, social justice, and this special attention to families. In other words, I think the link between looking out for families and upholding human rights and freedoms is very clear. And we also know that sadly, lots of people are still having their basic rights violated because society doesn't value families as it should. Let's just, just mention Article 16 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. When you look at what's going on around the world, it's obvious that the right to start a family, to live as a family, to live family values, to really give important, <coughs> import, the importance everybody should be given is not a reality everywhere and all the time. That's why at the core of our advocacy work, is understanding how the goals of the Copenhagen Declaration and the International Year go hand in hand. They go together, especially when it comes to tackling poverty, creating decent jobs, bringing people together, which are, I think, like the three main principles of the Copenhagen Declaration. And also, as you know, the, the resolutions of the General Assembly have been very, very based on these three ideas as the objectives of the international year. The um, poverty, decent jobs, and intergenerational solidarity have been like the real three points around which the whole preparation for and celebrations of the different anniversaries have gone around. And for 2024, also, the General Assembly outlined these four big mega trends uh, that have been getting a lot of attention over the past four years. Uh, how family life is affected by technology, by city living, by population change changes, or by climate change. But I think they are all very well rooted on this Copenhagen Declaration. So, knowing how important it is to deal with these trends, head on, especially with everything going on after the pandemic, we've set up online focus groups, for instance, to discuss about each one of these. The aim was to create useful content that not only informs, but also gives families practical advice they can use. And in addition to these efforts, as Renata has already mentioned, we have actively collaborated in convening a series of United Nations expert group meetings, regional expert group meetings, uh, in, in the Arab region, in Latin America, in North America, in Europe, and in Asia. Most of them also co-organized with the Doha Family Institute represented here. But this very last meeting, and I go back to it now for a moment, focus on the interlinkages between migration, urbanization, 
new technologies, demographic trends, and climate change in Asia has been especially enlightening because it has shown that quite often we forget that Asia is two-thirds of the world population, practically. And, um, and so the future has probably to count more with that world. And we, I mean, I am from Europe. Some of them are, some of you are also from Europe, from America. I think we have this, to make this a special effort to learn from what has been happening and what is happening and what can happen in Asia. Particularly, I wanted to focus in some points which are part of the recommendations of the expert group meeting. First, migration patterns are influenced by factors such as economic opportunities, political instability, environmental pressures. The rapid urbanization in Asia has led to the growth of cities and mega cities attracting migrants from rural areas and neighboring countries, stranding urban infrastructure and services, contributing to issues like overcrowding, inadequate housing, environmental degradation. If we were talking before about family values in society, which are human values at the end, maybe we need to think of how the situation of so many men in Asia having to work, to go to work in another country, leaving their families behind, can be solved. Because this means, I won't get into uh, ECD, we will have after, but I mean, how can we allow those children to grow without a father? Second, new technologies play a dual role in migration and urbanization for sure. Uh, uh, on one hand, advancements in transportation and communication have facilitated migration and urbanization by reducing barriers to mobility and enhancing connectivity between rural and urban areas. But on the other hand, Technology-driven industries and small city initiatives have transformed urban landscape, creating new employment opportunities, improving urban living standards, while also exacerbating disparities and displacing marginalized communities. So there is also a lot to be thought, to be learned, to be proposed, a lot of recommendations we can make on this. I'm trying to show you that we have a lot of work ahead in the following years. And these are just some ideas, but I, I, I would like to mention them. Three, demographic trends, including population growth, aging populations, and changing family structures, really are influencing migration and urbanization patterns. High population density in urban areas puts pressure on resources and infrastructure, while Aging populations pose challenges for healthcare systems and social welfare policies. Four, climate change adds, adds another layer of complexity to migration, urbanization, and demographic trends. Rising temperatures, extreme weather events, sea level rise, etc., etc., etc. Urbanization exacerbates climate change through increased carbon emissions and environmental degradation, with demographic shifts that affect vulnerability and resilience to climate-related risks. So when talking about interlinkages between those four megatrends, I think we have still, we have just started to see what we should do in the following years. It is true that there were some very good final recommendations, uh, like help families stick together by having better child care, uh, make sure everyone can use technology to make his families happier, uh, plan making cities smarter and greener, make it easier for families to stay together and help each other, no matter where they come from, and teach families how to be ready for 
bad things that might happen in the future, like floods, fires, by sharing information and getting ready for them. We speak a lot about unwanted loneliness, and that is a reality for older people and also for kids sometimes. But what about unwanted lack of information? This is something I think we need also to, to think about. Well, this extra group meeting uh, in Asia is just an example of the 28 events we have organized or co-organized at IFFD to prepare this anniversary. And the other event I wanted to mention is our World Congress that took place in Cebu, Philippines, with more than 1,300 delegates, underscoring the global resonance of our initiatives. We had people there from 51 countries. So it was very good to see what concerns families have in common, families from the five continents. And conversations during the Congress highlighted a notable gap in understanding regarding the nexus between family dynamics and climate change. This underscores the significance of our institutional position and the importance of educational initiatives to bridge this knowledge deficit. So drawing from all these experiences, I wanted to emphasize the paramount importance of prioritizing quality over quantity in our work. Uh, I know that I've just here <laughs> like to say a lot of things in a short time, but I hope that they inspire you and they inspire me and they inspire us to work better. And finally, you know, this is not all. Since 2019, we have been working with non-governmental organizations to create a new civil society declaration that is already finished and has been joined by quite a few organizations from all over the world. And um, we have had the help there of Generations United from the US, the Hungarian Last Families Association, the Doha International Family Institute again, the European Parents uh, Association, um, Haro from Sweden, uh, etc. Our main goal really with this declaration was to make sure Lawmakers, opinion makers, understand what families need, especially with the big challenges they are facing throughout the world. And this declaration has 11 very clear recommendations. I encourage you to read carefully and also to be the inspiration for your work in the, in the following months and the following years. To sum up, these 11 points show the important things our societies need right now. They highlight how we urgently need to work together to solve these problems. Uh, I, sometimes I feel that in daily life there are like three different levels. The, levels, the level of politicians or lawmakers the level of journalists or public opinion makers, and then the level of normal people who have to deal day to day with their own difficulties, their own problems, and who are the one who really justify the existence of everyone else and who need to be listened. So that's, that's my great hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignacio, and thank you for all the uh, revision of all, all the civil society declaration that we're definitely um, getting ready to present it on the 15th of May. I will now turn to Dr. Chemba Ragavan, Senior Advisor with the Early Childhood Development ECD team in UNICEF, headquarters in New York. Prior to joining the UNICEF headquarters in New York, Chemba worked in the UNICEF East Asia and Pacific Regional Office as the regional focal point of the United Nations Girls Education Initiative and as ECD Education Specialist. 
Dr. Raghavan has also served as a technical expert for UNESCO in Bangkok and research advisor in the Asian Pacific Regional Network for early childhood. With several years of experience as senior researcher assistant professor in the US, her areas of expertise include child development, parenting, cross-cultural lifespan, human development, and family studies, gender, socialization, family-friendly policies, research methods, and statistics. She has a PhD in human development and family studies from the Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Ragavan, you have the floor. Thank you. Thanks, can you all hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm here with a strong contingent from UNICEF representing our associate director, Irina Dia, who's here as uh, uh, the global lead for early childhood development. So all the good I say today is on behalf of me and everything else is on behalf of her. I, I'm joking, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm also speaking on behalf of numerous country offices in the East Asia Pacific region and the South Asia region, and of course around the globe, uh, who are doing the work, the real hard work of addressing how megatrends influence family development. Our heartfelt appreciation to the hosts, Permanent Mission of Malaysia, Doha Institute, uh, International Family Institute, and of course our longtime partners, the International Federation for Family Development. Thank you so much. It's also a privilege for me to be here because I was a child of Asia. I lived and breathed that air, uh, also, although not quite sure of the quality of that air. And that is what I'm going to talk about today, uh, is climate change as a mega trend and how that is impacting a big, a big part of families' early childhood development. So when we think about climate, I think the first words that we are primed to think about in today's world is about youth, young people, and what they can do uh, in the face of uh, climate change. That's perfectly correct. I'm a mother of young children myself and young adults myself. They, um, and they are active, you know, they're really uh, passionate about climate change. But I think the one important piece that we have forgotten is how children and very young children are impacted by climate change. Uh, and that's a mega trend that is staring us in the face. And we really have to be very, very cognizant of addressing this. Uh, uh, strongly to support not only the children, not only the young children, but also their parents and the caregivers and the nurturing environments that they can provide to children in the face of all of these mega trends. So I'm also accompanied by our uh, director from the Division of Communications from UNICEF. I told you we have a strong presence here today and we really care about the mega trends and the impact on families. So I will focus on climate change and early childhood development and Ben, my colleague, will speak about parenting and our work in the advocacy space on what we are doing in that, uh, in that space. Um, so let me get off uh, my face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's what we are talking about here. Um, so I submit to all of you five things that, uh, that uh, if we can go away keeping in mind. Early childhood development, and these are learnings. This is not something we've made up. These, these are learnings that we have come with from over 190 countries that we program in. Early childhood development is really a powerful equalizer in climate change inequities. We're starting to see uh, the impact, although in very initial stages, of how action in the early childhood development space can start to help families that are dealing with climate change issues. Climate change is, an, in its heart, a child rights crisis, and I don't think we can forget that. Early childhood development in the context of climate change is a really key building block in achieving the sustainable development goals. We're also learning that young children are not only victims of change, but can actually be agents of change. In the small efforts that we've started putting in, we're already seeing this passion in young children who want to be agents of change in this space. And we're also learning that the costs of inaction are very high, that they're going to cost countries in terms of economic development, in terms of women's employment, in terms of retention in the workforce, and so forth. Um, so those of you who have seen the diagram on the right, apologies, but those who haven't, that's a very powerful framework called the nurturing care framework 
that a lot of the early childhood development world is working with, but other communities are starting to see the value of looking at those simple five petals of the flower on the right side. Um, so what do children and young children and families need? That is the question that this uh, diagram is supposed to answer. They need good health. They need adequate nutrition. They need safety and security. They need opportunities for early learning and they need responsive care. If these five petals of a flower come together, we can already start building the social sector, the strengthening the social sector that uh, our keynote uh, opening remarks pointed to, that that's really, really critical, that these five pieces come together. It's a little um, uh, disheartening to know that nearly 90% of the burden of disease attributable to climate change is actually borne by children under age five. So this population is heavily impacted by the mega trend of climate change. So I urge all of us to start thinking about what we do for these young children. The first 1,000 days are really much more vulnerable than other stages in life. So we have to keep that in mind. With that, what do we know? What do we know about climate change and children? We know that children breathe more rapidly than adults. Those of us who have seen babies know that they do There's this you know, that they are, their lungs are still developing. They're really tiny. This puts children at a greater risk of actually developing respiratory illnesses or making existing uh, even, you know, more worse than uh, when exposed to air pollution. Uh, there's, uh, you know, in increased ground level ozone and wildfires that are causing these pollution, and, and that is actually impacting our children's lungs. More than 1,000 newborn deaths daily are actually attributed to air pollution. It's really, it breaks my heart to see numbers like this that are quite preventable. Higher metabolism and regulation of breathing is less than adults in babies. And in children under five, nearly 80% uh, of uh, malaria deaths, um, you know, are accounted for by children under five. So, um, you know, these are these are offshoots of the climate uh, mega trend. Diarrheal diseases are the second leading cause of child death, in addition to this 80% uh, of malaria deaths. Uh, children actually eat and drink more compared to their body mass, so they're actually very vulnerable to food insecurity, which is often uh, an effect of climate change. So children are particularly vulnerable to the consequences of food insecurity due to their rapid growth and development in this stage. So it's important that there is sufficient access to nutritious food because malnutrition can impair cognitive development and contribute to other health problems, which then have percolating effects to the economy and what we can do 20 years from now. Children really rely on adults for their physical and mental well-being. Uh, they depend on adults for nurturing care and their safety and security. So in a disaster, for example, they're actually more susceptible to injuries, for example, drowning or increased vulnerability due to separation from caregivers. And that can cause a lot of toxic stress in children. And, uh, you know, those are, those are adversities that can impair brain development, that can cause lasting damage uh, in children's development. So it's really, really important that those nurturing environments are provided right from the start to address uh, the strengthening of the social sector that we talked about. Now, a lot was said, thank you, Ignacio, for highlighting the whole migration is issue. We're also starting to look at that. What do we know about children on the move? We know that uh, nearly half of the world's 2.2 billion children, nearly 1 billion children, actually live in 33 countries which are ex at extremely high risk. Um, 100 million children were displaced due to weather-related events in 2020 alone. Children on the move are exposed to child protection risks. They're often unaccompanied. They could be subject to violence, to neglect, to abuse. And that can, again, uh, cause spiraling, uh, you know, long-term stress in the children. And the brain development, the neural connections that that brain needs can shut down in the face of those, uh, those adversities. Um, loss of access to learning, forced labor, you know, other unmet needs are also risks. And this is not just for young children, it's for children across the board, as we know. So globally, around 500 million children actually live in areas with very high risk of flooding, and flooding also due to climate uh, change, and nearly 160 million children living in areas of extreme or high risk of drought. 
Now, all is not gloom and doom. You know, I started with saying children and their families can be agents of change. So there are a lot of actions, and in my home continent of Asia, that has already happened. And thank you for highlighting some of the work that uh, Malaysia has already done. Uh, thank you for all the summaries of uh, action on the ground in, in Asia, Ignacio. Um, I want to highlight in the space of uh, early childhood development two important declarations that have just happened last year. In 2023, there was an ASEAN declaration on early childhood care and education in Southeast Asia. Um, which explicitly stated that a transformed early childhood care and education sector can actually play an essential role in adaptive capacities of communities. So what does that mean? That means the child care that we talked about, the parenting support that is absolutely critical, the policies that protect young children, the services and the programs that we provide for them all need to be in place in order for those risks to be mitigated right from the start. And we are very happy to note that the ASEAN Declaration has uh, acknowledged this. Uh, in 2023, also a very powerful Pacific Regional Forum for ACD, uh, an intergovernmental body that looks at early childhood development, which already had a declaration called the Pacifica Declaration, actually added an action point number 10 to the declaration, explicitly recognizing the impact of climate change on early childhood development. ARENA was part of that uh, momentous uh, gathering in the Pacific, and we were very proud to watch that you know, young children are uh, starting to surface in these government uh, declarations as part of a climate change discourse. So I think I think that you know, Asia can pat itself on its back for some of these uh, uh, interesting uh, developments. Uh, really, it's uh, it's uh, it's that transformative power of early childhood development, that parenting support, that nurturing care that we are talking about here that hasn't been addressed in the climate discourse. So we're urging all of you present in the room to take this forward as you talk, to talk about children, to talk about young children, to talk about parents and caregivers that surround them in the, in the discourse on climate change. Now, there are a few country examples from uh, what has been done. The government of Mongolia, uh, with UNICEF support, we always like to say, uh, has actually retrofitted kindergartens to improve young children's learning environments while really um, you know, increasing energy efficiency and combating air pollution. It sounds like a small action, but could have huge benefits. Right? Youth engagement on advocacy for young children. So we're now connecting two age groups across the life course. You have young children's uh, uh, issues being coming uh, coming up to the, in the forefront, but also young adults speaking, adolescents and youth speaking about young children who who, who they are sort of um, precursing uh, in development. So during the 2022 Asia Pacific Regional Network for Early Childhood Conference, youth advocate actually heralded the call from the Minister of Health in Fiji for greater inclusion of young children in the climate agenda. Uh, there, there, there have been numerous policy fora in the Pacific region to elevate early childhood development's visibility in climate change adaptation processes. In Vietnam, there are multi-level climate and uh, disaster risk reduction initiatives. With the Ministry of Education, UNICEF has developed and institutionalized a national climate smart school framework, uh, including at a pre-primary level. So with the National College of Education, and this uh, survey has actually been conducted at early childhood education institutions to understand behaviors of environmental protection in preschools. So these are pretty uh, interesting um, developments. Now globally, um, and then there are partners, partners that are working you know, together, the, our, our office in the East Asia Pacific region, uh, the Asia Pacific Regional Network for Early Childhood, several governments have already partnered together and produced quite a few investment cases. There's been calls to action. There's been a lot of uh, um, emphasis on young children uh, in the region. So I'm not going to go over all of that. Um, now, coming back to the global world, what are we doing with all of this knowledge that we get from you all from the ground? We are trying to elevate all of your work. We are trying to uh, ensure that countries are learning from each other. We are also trying to ensure that we reflect our learnings into practical resources and concrete tools. So as part of our Healthy Environments for Healthy Children framework, for example, to combat heat stress, uh, you know, we have a module called BEAT, the heat, which is actually an acronym, B-E-A-T, be aware for the B, easily identify for the E, A, act immediately to protect, 
and T take to health facility, which is a very simple sort of acronym, but has very complex uh, impact when you when you roll it out with the you know uh, frontline workers through our existing systems and platforms. So that's just one example of the kind of work that we are doing based on the knowledge. Now, global directions and what we are focused on as an early childhood development community in UNICEF and with partners, we are looking at four areas of work. One is child-focused interventions. What is it we can work with children themselves on, right? Like in a preschool context or in a childcare context. Children have a natural tendency to love nature, which we call biophilia. We are trying to leverage this biophilia. We are trying to build on their innate capacity to respect and love nature. And how do we then build that sensitivity in children? We can do a lot of child-focused interventions around that. So we have existing packages that we are trying to modify in that space. We have parent and caregiver-focused initiatives that we are going to focus on, sort of green parenting and how we, how we promote uh, this in the homes of children. Uh, system strengthening, which is our bread and butter. We work with workforce, we work on governance, we work on coordination, we work on budgets. So in all of those, we're trying to put young children front and center as instrumental, not just as victims, but as agents of change. And lastly, adapted and really sustainable infrastructure that can protect and promote children's development fully. Some examples uh, in the policy space, for example, what is it we can do? Can we ensure that early childhood development is explicitly included in climate policy documents? Can we ensure that there is governance for sustainable ECD and climate action? These are just illustrative actions. In the program space, can we do early learning programs that leverage on this biophilia that we've talked about, green schools, kitchen gardens, uh, you know, preschool standards that pertain to climate. Lots of things we can do, workforce strengthening, and really leveraging our community platforms to be active partners in the programming space. Civil society has a very major role in this space to play, and we are looking to, you know, sort of engage further in discussions and thought leadership around this issue. Uh, in practices, how can, we, how can we promote parenting practices? For example, resources and tips for greening homes, eco-parenting programs uh, that we can take to scale. So there's a lot that we can do if we come together. Uh, there is a video uh, on supporting young children uh, if, and why this is a smart investment. And if we have time, we can play that later. I don't want to hog a, a lot of the time that you have. But, you know, it's, it's about nurturing. It's about nurturing care. When I was studying, I was told it was nature versus nurture. No longer. It's about nurturing care with nature. Nurture with nature. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Chemba. Thank you for all those insights. And let us turn to Mr. Benjamin Perks. Head of Campaigns and Advocacy in the Division of Global Communications and Advocacy at UNICEF Headquarters in New York. Mr. Perks leads public and policy advocacy on the development and protection of children. He has extensive experience in human rights diplomacy, particularly in UNICEF in both the Republic of North Macedonia and the Republic of Montenegro. His work spans various continent, uh, countries, including Georgia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, India, and Albania. Notable achievements include coordinating the back to school campaign in northern Afghanistan, which enrolled millions of children, especially girls, into school and for many for the first time. He has also focused on demobilization child soldiers, improving conditions for children in state care, addressing child poverty, and advocating for disability inclusion. Mr. Perks is a senior fellow at the University of Birmingham, which researches education policy on character, social, and emotional development of children and an associate faculty member at Oxford University Department of Social Policy and Innovation. He is a campaigner ending child trauma and will publish his Attachment Revolution book in 2025. Looking forward to reading that. <laughs> you. Um, you have the floor, Mr. That, that photo is a few kilograms ago, and I apologize <laughs> for, for any disappointment caused. Um, thank Absolutely. You. <laughs> Thank you very much for the, the introduction, um, and thank you uh, for colleagues from the Permanent Mission of Malaysia, um, the Doe Institute, and IFFD for hosting this, uh, this great session today. I, if we could, oh, I, I've got it, right, there it is. Um, 
I, I want to talk about another mega trend that is a positive mega trend. I'm not sure it's just if you could really call it a mega trend, but maybe we're the first generation in history to be really mega cognitive, to really think about the way we parent, you know, to be aware of, um, of the emotional and social development of our children in a way that we never were before, but to also recognize the intergenerational nature of that, to recognize that some things may have been great in our own childhood and some things not, and we can improve on that to have better outcomes for our own children. Why do I think this is a mega trend? Well, here in the United States, there's a $46 billion a year industry on giving parents tips, giving them guidance, and the conversation about parenting. In India, one parent parenting app that promotes evidence-based knowledge on parenting has got 30 million subscribers. And if you go in a bookshop anywhere from uh, Cape Town to, uh, to, to, uh, to South Korea to Saudi Arabia, anywhere else in the world, you will find non-fiction uh, shelves packed with books about parenting, trauma, mental health, healing, all of these things that add up to the same to the same thing. And it has revolutionized, I think, the way that we think about childhood globally. And this is a huge opportunity for us. And a couple of things that we've learned, obviously, are that this, you know, and everybody knows this in the room, that this first few years of life are so powerful in determining our emotional, social, cognitive development, uh, and to setting the way that we will see the world live our lives and contribute to our family, our community, our society throughout the whole life lifespan. Uh, and a couple of the things that we've learned are that children are not born and then form relationships. They're born into relationships. They are born recognizing the voice of their mother and they will do anything to hear that voice. They will move towards um, a, par a parent or a caregiver for loving attachment and the deprivation of that loving attachment, which is much more common than we think for preventable reasons, has a huge cost for children. Because children, safety is not just, um, sorry, um, violence, uh, threat is not just the presence of violence, it's the absence of love. And we know in terms of nurturing that children are asking 100 questions an hour from the moment they're born, often through glancing and babbling and eventually through language. And it's the, res the response of the parents to those questions and later on the preschool to those questions that determine and power the brain growth and the, the way that the child sees, uh, sees the world. And this provides enormous opportunities for policymakers, for human rights activists, and everybody that loves children, which hopefully, hopefully is most of us. But there is a huge threat that we are now aware of in a way that we were not before, and that is uh, adverse childhood experiences, including physical neglect, physical violence, uh, emotional neglect, emotional violence, often, not always, often transmitted intergenerationally, unwittingly, and unintentionally, and they are preventable. But let me just um, talk to you a minute about the prevalence of those because for most of recent history, we have thought that the prevalence of people affected by these kind of risks is 1% or 2% of our society. And we got that so wrong. It was covered in plain sight because of taboo and shame and stigma. But now we know it's much more prevalent than we ever thought before. So if we look across countries, across the world, and you know there are many other countries that have had similar studies of, um, violence against children studies and others, they show that more than half of us have experienced one of those adverse adversities on the prior page, and 13% of us have experienced four or more. And the average classroom, the average parliament, the average prevalence in a population is something like this. The majority of people have experienced some form of adversity. But the people at the very back of the classroom with three or four adverse childhood experiences are much greater risk of almost every single well-being outcome, where it's physical health, mental health, addiction, um, propensity to be involved with violence as a victim or a perpetrator, trafficking, 
uh, gang recruitment, and many other well-being indicators are much, much likely to do worse. And this is something that is correlated across societies. This is data from routine surveillance of states in the US, but you find similar outcomes in multiple countries across the world, across continents, across cultures. This is not culturally specific. It is a neurobiological reality affecting every community in the world. It's not a them problem anymore. It's an us problem. And it really is time for us to act. Even if people are not interested in human rights, there is an economic cost to this because we estimate about 8% of GDP. The very conservative estimate globally is lost each year. In North America and Europe alone, 1.3 trillion is spent each year just on the health outcomes of adverse child experiences, not the things related to crime or security or mental health that I mentioned, just the physical health consequences. Conversely, we know from multiple studies that early investment, particularly in parenting programs, yields a vast return. Program Programs that can prevent adverse child experiences cost a fraction of what we spend in responding to them later on in the life cycle. This is why we need to invest early. Um, so one of the things that we are, um, one, perhaps the most significant accelerator for prevention of adversity and for ensuring that every child grows up safe and loved are parenting programs, evidence-based parenting programs. 25% of uh, countries uh, globally report that they have evidence-based parenting programs reaching a significant percentage of the population. Those programs focus on normally on visits to the household, sometimes on group sessions, sometimes backed up by uh, information online or on mobile phones but they look at optimizing opportunities for child development, building the attachment between the, relation, between the child and the parent, helping the parent to understand how to play. We sometimes forget that people that grow up in neglectful homes or homes with high levels of stress on education performance don't play. And they're adults who don't know how to play. They feel awkward, but that can be addressed through, for example, a home visit and a conversation with an expert. Increasing um, support also for health and nutrition through parenting programs. Often parenting programs are embedded within health visiting systems. And the reason, one of the reasons we have to celebrate is that last year a WHO-led, UNICEF-supported um, meta-analysis of parenting programs uh, with 435 randomized control trials from across 65 countries showed that parenting programs are evidence to improve nurturing care outcomes, to improve development outcomes, to prevent maltreatment, all things that they intended to do, but they do one thing that wasn't an intentional part of parenting programs, they improve mental health. We don't know why, but we have a guess. Maybe it's because love heals. A parent who has not grown up in a loving context but forms an attachment with their child is going through a healing process. There is also, of course, the fact that having somebody show up and help you to have a structured approach and a st strategic approach to your parenting is also something that is a tremendous uh, relief for, um, for stressed out parents who, who parenting doesn't come naturally to. I want to leave you with a revolutionary idea. Um, in the 1980s, the UN, UNICEF, WHO, governments all around the world decided they wanted to dramatically end, dramatically reduce child mortality. They created a sharp focus on increasing vaccine coverage. In 1980, vaccines only covered 20% of the world population. They increased it to 80% in, in 10 years. Uh, oral rehydration salts and growth monitoring and breastfeeding, two aspects of nutrition support, were rolled out as universal norms. There was a big argument about whether we, should, whether we can really have such a sharp focus or should we just work on everything at the same time. This sharp focus reduced child mortality by 61% within two decades. 
And of course, it changed all the other things in the world as well related to child and maternal health and, 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 and child development because we no longer lived in a world where it was acceptable that children would die of preventable death. Could we now, our generation, imagine a child development revolution where we aim for every child to grow up safe, loved, and nurtured by delivering three simple, affordable, doable interventions. Parental leave at a very minimum in line with World Health Organization guidelines on, on, on six months for, um, for mother and four months for, for, for father, but preferably longer. Parenting programs, evidence-based parenting programs for every family on the planet and every three to six-year-old to have a place in early childhood education. This sounds like a dream, but it's possible if we work together to achieve it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Perkson. Now, I, in the last minutes that we have, I'm going to turn to our last speaker, uh, Mr. Fatima al Motawa, Research and Grand Specialist at the Doha International Family Institute. She holds a master's degree in political science and international relations from the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies and a bachelor's degree in international affairs from Qatar University. Fatima coordinates the OSRA Research Grant by overseeing prospective researchers and projects. She is a key advisor on various families related issues in academic and scientific research. Ms. Almotawa, the floor is yours. Can I get my presentation? Yep. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fatma Almotawa from DP. Uh, and actually, I'm honored to represent Qatar in this session which I will be focused on discussing uh, some of the major insights regarding the population and the fertility in Qatar. Thank you for joining us. To the, to the right. Okay. So um, this is the content that I will be uh, focused on, uh, but mainly I will focus on the main factors that affect the fertility decisions in Qatar. And I will conclude with some recommendations based on the studies conducted uh, uh, by DFI. Uh, Qatar has experienced profound demographic transitions over recent decades. Uh, with that, uh, uh, that gives Qatar uh, the, to prioritize the increase of its fertility rates, uh, especially with the uh, gradually expanding of the demographic of older adults. Uh, and with declining the fertility uh, uh, rates in Qatar, uh, which leads to fewer children being born. Uh, the decline poses a significant challenge to the Qatari government, uh, especially in its efforts to increase the Qatari population uh, uh, among other population. Uh, despite rapid economic and the social changes, uh, Qatar has maintained its cultural and traditional values as an Arab and Islamic nation, considering the family to be the main unit and the main pillar of society, which is actually uh, protected and preserved by uh, law uh, in Qatar, which is uh, listed in Article 21 of uh, the Qatari institution. Uh, and much like the other families, the Qatari family actually faces a lot of challenges and changes throughout the years, especially in its structures, uh, its functions, uh, re uh, relationships, gender roles, and even its characteristics, uh, with also the dynamics of fertility present a, a, a particular concern as well. According to our latest statistics, the number of Qatari population for both Qatari and non-Qatari has reached around 3,120,000 people live in Qatar. Uh, and this demographic snapshot actually reveals a significant increase, not only in Qatari population, but also uh, uh, in the segment of elderly residents, which leads us toward an aging uh, population. Uh, nearly uh, uh, a third of century, the number of elderly individuals aged 65 and above has reached, uh, has increased ninefold. And our projections uh, state that by the year 2050, the number of uh, 60 uh, year and, uh, and above will reach 30% of the total population. 
And these changes actually highlight, uh, of course, by the significant advancement in, uh, in health care, uh, environment conditions, and overall living standards in the country. As for the fertility changes uh, uh, in Qatar, uh, much like our neighbor uh, uh, Arab Gulf countries, Qatar uh, actually experienced uh, a declining fertility rates, as you can see from the chart uh, uh, on the screen. Uh, this chart is over the last three decades, uh, which lists that there is a decrease from 5.3 uh, in 1986, which reached to 2.9 in 2017. Uh, and ac this actually uh, concern, uh, as I mentioned, the Qatari government to, to, to boost uh, its population growth and to have uh, like some uh, a, a kind of plan to, to, to increase the, the, the Qatari uh, citizenship, uh, which because of uh, this corresponds with, uh, as I mentioned, a decreasing proportion of citizens within uh, the total population. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, the, uh, this presentation was based on uh, two main uh, studies that were conducted at DFI, uh, <coughs> and this is, this is the metho methodology that we have used in the studies. Uh, I will focus mainly on the second one, uh, which titled Social Aspects of Fertility in Qatar. Uh, this study actually was conducted exclusively with a Qatari sample. Uh, therefore, all of the findings in this presentation uh, uh, is based, are based on perspectives from the Qatari population. <coughs> According to uh, the study that I mentioned, uh, that was conducted in 2023, uh, these are the five main factors uh, that uh, uh, influence or that affect the fertility decisions uh, among Qatari people. Uh, which I will try to, to focus on the main points uh, because of the time constraints. The first factor is the personal factor. Uh, in this uh, uh, factor, uh, the participants highlight a significant societal shift towards prioritizing quality over quantity, as mentioned by Ignacio earlier as well, uh, which also influenced many uh, of participants, and especially Qatari particip participants, to choose smaller family sizes rather than have uh, a lot or more children. Uh, at is it, okay, at it's appear in uh, the chart, uh, also in, in, on the screen, we have asked the participants what do they think uh, the main reasons uh, for Qatari people to, to, uh, <coughs> to have less children than they used to, 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 to have. Uh, and the total uh, participants agreed around 81% uh, from uh, male and females that the reason is because of the emotional stagnation between spouses, which lead to have less children. As for the economic factor, uh, it uh, is uh, uh, significantly influ influencing fertility rates in Qatar. Uh, and our data reveals that financial burdens of marriage, including weddings and housing, uh, tend to be carried by families. And uh, the cost, the high cost associated with these financial burdens, uh, sorry, these financial burdens uh, of marriage uh, actually has led 87% uh, of the participants to see the high cost of marriage uh, as a main uh, factor of uh, declining the, the marriage uh, uh, rates and uh, in return uh, uh, declining the number of, uh, of families and the number of children. And also uh, <coughs> the cost of child upbringing as well, uh, primarily the education and healthcare, uh, was highlighted by most women and some men uh, uh, in this study, uh, confirmed by 63% of the participants uh, that it is actually uh, uh, also a main reason of having fewer children. <coughs> the structural and contextual factors, uh, the accessibility of global cultures and ideas has led to re-evaluation of personal freedom and responsibilities. Uh, <clears throat> and the impact of globalization uh, affected the, the marriage and the marriage trend and the family structures uh, uh, for Qatari people. Uh, and this increase rates, uh, this increase uh, affected uh, the, 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 the delaying in marriage and the, the increasing in sing uh, singlehood uh, which uh, also, uh, uh, ha as I said, that was affected by the globalization, uh, and it's actually for both male and female. 
the rise in, in divorce, uh, as you can see also in the slide, uh, also reflects these changes values. Uh, and interestingly, nearly uh, half of the participants also recognize that the autonomy of nuclear families uh, influences fertility dynamics, uh, which meaning that there were some uh, complex interactions between uh, having personal choice and having fewer children and the traditional uh, family structures and the context of the global influences. As for the uh, educational factor, uh, uh, the education actually has also affected the fertility decisions within families, uh, particularly regarding the number and timing of children. Uh, and our research showed that people with, uh, or couples with, uh, with higher education tend to want fewer children. And this pattern is primarily due to the combined uh, demands of careers and family life, as well as more informed approach of parenting. <clears throat> Additionally, while the impact of women's higher educational status on fertility decisions was debatable, most participants felt that it did not actually lead to fewer children. However, some suggested that higher education might shift a, a woman's focus uh, on her career, uh, toward her career, than having uh, uh, an expansion to, to her family. Uh, as for the factors related to work-family balance, uh, many participants actually pointed out that there are some challenges uh, uh, of, pal of balancing uh, a successful career and uh, with the desire of having children, especially in, uh, the, in, in an environment that lack uh, a supportive uh, work-family uh, policy policies. And to address these challenges, participants advocated the, the necessity of having uh, uh, extended uh, maternity leaves and accessible uh, workplace daycare, uh, as well as a flexible, a flexible work uh, uh, schedules. And as it's shown uh, in the chart, we, were, we asked also some of our participants uh, on what do they think are the major re uh, reasons of decreasing fertility caused by work family uh, policies, and the majority uh, around 85% uh, agreed that not having supportive pol uh, uh, work pol policy, uh, uh, work balance uh, policies that help them and support them, led, uh, led them to have uh, f fewer children. As for the last uh, factor, uh, which is the health factor, uh, findings indicate that a healthy lifestyle, uh, including regular exercises uh, and having like a balanced diet, uh, positively affect fertility. Whereas unhealthy habits are linked to increased sterility in both men and women. And notably, 44% of our participants agreed that sterility uh, uh, rates are rising. Uh, almost all participants uh, <clears throat> mentioned knowing about cases of infertility rates with these new methods. And uh, around 33% uh, of female and 30% of male believe uh, that there is a gender preference in birth, meaning wanting a male child uh, has re often res res uh, results in having several pregnancies until a boy is born. Uh, based on uh, our findings, these recommendations are crucial for addressing the fertility challenges. And by implementing these targeted policies, we aim to enhance family support structures, improving financially, uh, uh, improve uh, financially assistance for families and increase awareness about fertility issues, uh, <clears throat> mainly uh, to modify, uh, uh, the, uh, as I men mentioned, the work family policies uh, to extend the, the, the labor uh, laws with, for uh, at least six months uh, paid maternity leave and uh, set up marriage and child development funds, as well as enhance research on de uh, demographic trends and mandate premarital courses and health screening. In conclusion, uh, our demographic trends toward an aging society demand detailed projections to address these challenges, uh, especially in healthcare, workforce development, and social security. And proactive planning is uh, crucial to support all generations, ensuring a resilient society. 
And at the end, on behalf of DFI, I would like to invite you all to celebrate our 30th anniversary of International Year of uh, Family that will be held in Qatar on uh, 29th of October 2024. And if you need more information, you are welcome to visit our website. Thank you so much. Thank you, Farima. And just to think we don't have enough time for any more questions, but I encourage you to visit our website. We're going to convey all the PowerPoints and presentations there. And let me just mention four things. The first one, the appreciation for uh, Malaysia for their co-sponsorship. Uh, Leticia and Kateri that you've seen here uh, helping us. Even I'll, talking about families, I'll form a family with her next week. So, with Kateri. And And I'll, I'm going to also mention and acknowledge the contribution from the IFFD Foundation here, represented by Luis, who is coming all the way from Mexico. Thank you, Luis, and all your family and friends. Um, then I'm going to mention opportunities that have been mentioned during this uh, side event. First, the International Day of Play. I guess that's a great opportunity for us to convey many of these messages. The, well, the second one, which is actually coming up first, the International Year of the Family that is going to commemorate the third anniversary. And then we have many other uh, opportunities. Here's uh, Asura from the Malaysia Mission that she knows, and she's going to be involved in the third committee um, discussions. And we definitely can convey many of these recommendations for her to be ready for all those <laughs> discussions. And the last one will be the World Social Summit that is coming up. There are many uh, guidelines or even modalities how to participate, how to suggest things and definitely it's going to be an open uh, discussion. Now, what the only thing that we know is uh, there are two countries involved in the negotiations. And I'll ask you even to the speakers to send us your takeaways from this uh, event as recommendations for policy making. And now we'll, uh, we'll ask you to have a picture with us all here with the logo, please. Thank you so much for all.